introduction. Madeline Ng is a pharmacist with the Visiting Nurse Services of Newport and Bristol Counties in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Following graduation from MCPHS University in May of 2015, she completed a community pharmacy residency with the University of Rhode Island and with Rite Aid Pharmacy. She's a certified diabetes outpatient educator and cardiovascular disease outpatient educator. Her professional experience includes working with patients in home health care, nursing homes, and community pharmacy settings. Her interests include transitions of care and the role pharmacists have in optimizing medication therapy to improve patient outcomes, reduce readmissions, and most importantly, improve patient quality of life. So we're delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much for an introduction. Um, again, my name is Madeline. Thank you all for attending. I know it's the last session of the day and the sun is out and it's beautiful outside, but I do appreciate you all coming um, to my presentation titled Integration of a Pharmacist on the Home Health Care Team to Address Medication-Related Hospitalizations. First and foremost, I do not have any financial interests or arrangements um, to disclose. Today I'll be discussing three learning objectives. The first is explain the partnership between the University of Rhode Island College of Pharmacy and the Visiting Nurse Services of Newport and Bristol Counties. Secondly, I would discuss the role of the pharmacist on VNS service and how they complement the care provided by the VNS interdisciplinary team. Third, I will review results from the Van Buren Charitable Foundation Year One grant awarded to add a part-time pharmacist to the VNS care team. My practice setting, again, is located at the Visiting Nurse Services of Newport and Bristol Counties. For all intensive purposes, I will be referring to them as the VNS, just to save time and so I don't tongue-tie myself during this presentation. We are an independent, nonprofit organization serving patients of all ages. We have home care, rehabilitation, hospice, and community health services. And uniquely, we do also have telehealth monitoring offered to our patients. There were no pharmacy services prior to our first pharmacy resident on the care team, which I will explain a little further in the next few slides. So the program began with the University of Rhode Island College of Pharmacy, clinical associate professor Ginger LeMay in July of 2013. Since then, we've had 25 sixth year pharmacy students completing an ambulatory care rotation at the VNS. Throughout the state, we have partnered with numerous home health care agencies, including the VNS, and students have the opportunity to gain experience in medication reconciliation and medication teaching in the home care setting. This has been an extremely fulfilling and valuable experience for the students since they have limited experience throughout the curriculum to be part of an inter interdisciplinary team with nurses, physical therapists, and occupational therapists to apply the clinical knowledge that they learned in pharmacy school. Along with the pharmacy students, we have had four pharmacy residents at the visiting nurse service as well. Tom Calista was our first pharmacy resident in 2013, um, and the next resident was Corinne that was the third pharmacy resident, and our fourth pharmacy resident is Catherine Corsi. She is currently completing her residency right now at the VNS, um, graduating in July of this year. Pharmacy residents are licensed pharmacists pursuing additional training and clinical experience after graduation from pharmacy school. The residency is a one-year commitment with University of Rhode Island and Rite Aid Pharmacy. However, the visiting nurse service is an additional ambulatory care site for the residency. The rotation is a longitudinal rotation at the visiting nurse service, which means that from July to June, the pharmacy resident is at the visiting nurse service one to two days a week, providing home visits and additional services for the nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists. A requirement for the residency as well is the development and implementation of a year-long research project. We are allowed to come up with a topic of our own, develop it, and implement it in a site that we choose. As you can see, there have been three research projects that have been based out of the visiting nurse service. The first project was Tom's project based on heart failure, medication adherence, and rehospitalization. The next research project was my research project on telehealth monitoring. And lastly, the current project that Catherine, our current resident, is implementing is revolved around medication therapy management. And this is a very exciting presentation, and I will discuss this further, because this will give us ways to 
fully support, hopefully, a full-time pharmacist at the visiting nurse service. So just because I like to put faces with names, um, this is a picture of Ginger LeMay, Tom Calissa, our first resident, and myself last year. A little bit about our program history, the Visiting Nurse Service likes to utilize Facebook to appeal to their masses. Um, so this is a picture of Corinne on the bottom left and Catherine, our current resident, on the right. So to start off, I'd like to present some data that we have collected with our students at the Visiting Nurse Service. We do ask the pharmacy students on rotation to document the type of visit that was provided and the intervention provided, especially for high-risk medication classes. All information, of course, has been de-identified and is HIPAA compliant. Each student is paired with a nurse or physical therapist, so they are exposed to a wide range of patients at the VNS. The students and nurses will often switch off every week so that they are paired with a different nurse and a different physical therapist as the caseloads are different between all therapists. The data serves so that we can not only see what type of patients are on service, but also so we can understand the impact that the pharmacy profession can have on patients and the inter interdisciplinary team in the home care setting. As you can see on this slide, we started collecting data in spring of 2014, so here. Um, this is the highest number of patient visits because at that time we had a lot more sites included. But here on the top line, you can see the amount of patient visits that the students have seen per semester. The next line, the blue line here, shows the amount of med reconciliation that was provided. Ideally, every single patient that was seen should have a medication reconciliation performed. However, a lot of times the nurses have the same patients, so week after week, a medication reconciliation may not be performed if the patients haven't had any changes in medications. Lastly, the green line shows the amount of med teaching that was provided to the patients. And as you can see, it's been fairly consistent year after year, semester after semester. The type of interventions and outcomes are listed here on this slide. If the patients provided adherent support, they would let us know. Um, there have been a total of 387 opportunities for adherent support. The red line here shows the amount of interventions just in the past year, so in fall 2016. Other interventions include prevented an additional prescription order, prevented a physician visit, prevented an ER visit, reduced medication costs, prevented a hospital admission, and also prevented a life-threatening situation. The students are asked to assess the type of interventions provided, so therefore a lot of these are subjective. In 2014, the National Action Plan developed to identify common, preventable, and measurable adverse drug events that may result in significant harm. It identified three drug classes most commonly implicated in adverse drug events for Medicare beneficiaries. These include these specific drug classes, the anticoagulants, diabetic agents, as well as opioids. We asked students to identify how many of their patients are taking any medications in these classes. If a patient was on a medication in any of these classes, the student was asked to further and more thoroughly assess the patient for the potential of an adverse drug event or an actual drug event occurring in the patient. For example, as you can see in the opioid section, oops, there was 150 total patients screened. Of these total 150 patients, there were 32 patients identified for a potential adverse drug event. An example of a potential drug event is a patient who is taking opioid medication, say Vicodin or Percocet, but have no bowel regimen on board. As we know, opioids have a high risk of causing constipation in many of their patients. On the other hand, four was reported to have an actual, I'm sorry, eight was reported to have an actual adverse drug event. So what this means is that perhaps the patient was actually impacted and have, hasn't had a bowel movement in a long period of time that is an actual drug event, therefore requiring medical intervention. A common question that I'm always asked is, what role does the pharmacist have at the visiting nurse service? And now that we have discussed the role of pharmacy students in home care, I think this is a good time to transition to what a licensed pharmacist can do in the home. First and foremost, 
we provide home visits to the patients. We are involved in telehealth monitoring, as you will see in the next slides when I discuss my research project. We are part of the hospice and palliative care team. Every two weeks, the pharmacist will meet with the hospice group to discuss every single patient on hospice, and the pharmacist is valuable in that sense to discuss medications that could help or possibly harm the patient on hospice, any recommendations on doses or how to prevent a drug event, and of course, to make the, the patient as comfortable as possible. The pharmacist also does community outreach. Last spring, I teamed up with the um, the community outreach nurse at the visiting nurse service and visited senior homes to discuss healthy aging and discuss how to better manage your medications. We also provide diabetes education. In Rhode Island, we have a lot of patients on service that have diabetes, so we have community outreach diabe diabetes education groups for these patients. We have, are, of course, the drug information specialists. We provide medication therapy management for patients as well as primary care case conferences. And to discuss the home visit process, I'd like to open up with a patient case. So Mr. A is an 86-year-old male. He is widowed. He lives alone. His family is out of state. His past medical history is significant for CHF, diabetes, COPT, and hypertension. In the winter of 2016, in the last snowstorm, he went outside to shovel his driveway and fell and broke his hip. He was sent to the hospital. While he was in the hospital, his metformin was discontinued because his kidneys uh, started to decline. His insulin regimen was increased. His A1C was found to be 12%, which suggests noncompliance to his medications. He got better and was sent to a skilled nursing facility. At the skilled nursing facility, he was found to have edema on his ankles, so his Lasix was increased. There was a planned discharge date set up, and the day before, he develops pneumonia and was started on an antibiotic. Now, because of his insurance, they found that pneumonia is not a reason to leave him skillable, so he's actually sent home with the antibiotics to finish the course and the skilled nursing facility luckily provides medications for the patient to go home with. So the next day, the visiting nurse service goes and visits this patient. At home, they find blister packs, bags and bags of blister, blister packs from the skilled nursing facility. They find old medications because, of course, he is put on a 90-day supply at his community pharmacy. He's set on automatic refill as well, which is why he has piled up medications in his cabinets and in his drawers. He has expired beds, including expired insulin, which may suggest why his A1C was so high, as well as why they had to increase the insulin regimen in the hospital. The medications are not matching on the skilled nursing facility discharge sheet to what he has at home. And to top it all off, he has a cabinet full of over-the-counter medications that he's accumulated from friends and family. And this is usually the part of the admission where I will get an email or a phone call saying, Madeline, please help. There is a lot going on with this patient. So I, as you can see in this patient, he would benefit mostly from a medication reconciliation. So this is to review the medications that he was sent home from, from the skilled nursing facility. Medication teaching, because maybe he doesn't know that insulin expires, and that's why he's been using expired insulin. Adherence support, so if he's on a 90-day supply with automatic refills, he probably shouldn't have a year's worth of medications at home if he was adherent to his medications. We are also community and community pharmacy referral and liaison, so maybe at that time we will call the pharmacy to let them know that there's been a change in the medication and to please stop filling all the medications automatically. And lastly, we can provide communi prescriber communication interface so most importantly in this patient, I would call his primary care physician, his endocrinologist, and probably his cardiologist to let them know that this patient was in the hospital, sent to the skilled nursing facility, and is now home, but has a lot of medication changes. And this is just a classic example of one patient, many, a very, very common patient that I see. However, sometimes the patients are not as complex as this one. But as you can see, 
this one patient could benefit from every single thing on this slide. So this patient that I also have told you about would be a good candidate for telehealth monitoring at the visiting nurse service, and this is what I based my research project on last year at the visiting nurse service. As we know, telehealth monitoring is an in-home monitoring program allowing nurses to monitor patient vital signs. High-risk patients are selected by the visiting, nurse the visiting nurse service nurses to be monitored using telehealth technologies. The patient's weight, blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen saturation are collected and transmitted daily through a secure server. The values are then analyzed by assigned healthcare providers at the home healthcare setting. Subjective questions related to patient's health can also be programmed into the machine. My study was a prospective study approved by the University of Rhode Island Institutional Review Board with the primary objective to determine the etiology of medication-related problems identified through telehealth monitoring systems. The telehealth monitoring system that we use at the VNS is the home med monitor. The home med monitor can be set to have specific alert limits. So the weight is patient-specific. We have specific limits on systolic and diastolic blood pressure, SpO2, as well as heart rates. So when the value goes above or below, these values, then we would get an alert at the visiting nurse service. Medication-related home med monitor alert questions were scheduled to be answered by the patient every Tuesday, so I asked for the machines to be programmed to have these three questions go off every Tuesday for the patient to answer. These questions include, are you out of any of your medications? Are you having difficulty taking any of your medications? As well as, have there been any changes in the medication you are taking? So if a patient had a vital sign alert out of range and also answered yes to any of the medication-related questions, the patient would be contacted for inclusion. A home visit would be scheduled, so every single patient in my study was seen by myself. Um, informed consent was provided and obtained. I interviewed the patient as well as categorized their medication-related problem. The interview questions consisted of six subjective questions. It was very quick. The first one, how are you feeling today? The second question assessed how many patient, how many medications, prescription and non-prescription medications was the patient on? The third question assessed how they were taking the medications. Was it one time during the day, everything all in the morning, or was it throughout the day? The fourth question asked how many times a week did they forget to take their medications? The fifth question, and the six questions are both very important in my perspective. The fifth one asks, do you understand what your medications are used for? And number six, do you feel differently now than you did before you started your medications? The enrollment period was very short. It was December 2015 to March 2016. I had a total of 10 patients enrolled in this study. Um, now we have to remember that this was a very limited time that I had my research designed and also implemented, as well as the time constraint as a pharmacy resident. The mean age was 75 and a half, and the mean number of medications, which is alarming, was 16.4 medications. So on average, patients had 16.4 medications, prescription and non-prescription medications. It's the ones that I found on reconciliation. The primary diagnosis, as you can see, most patients had CHF. Um, some patients also had COPD, AFib, one patient only had high blood pressure. The youngest patient that was included in my study was 35 years old, the oldest was 93 years old. And in terms of number of medications, the highest amount of medications that one patient had was 28. And this includes a lot of over-the-counter supplements. The home med monitor alerts were then categorized into these percentage. So as you can see, most patients had a weight that was out of range. Three patients had a reported weight outside of range. As you know, in patients with CHF, this is something that we need to take a look at and to call the doctor to perhaps increase the Lasix. Um, many patients also had a blood, pre blood pressure out of range. Five patients reported that they were out of their medications 
Thankfully, only one person admitted that they were having difficulty taking any of their medications, and this was because the pills were too big and he couldn't swallow the pills. The last question, have there been any changes in the medications you were taking? Nine patients said that yes, they had a change in the medication that they were taking. When asked the interview questions, the most percentage of patients who reported that they forgot to take their medications during the week was one time a week, and five patients reported that they would forget at least once. Um, as you can see, six patients did not understand what the medications were used for. And these six patients, they just said, well, my doctor told me I need to take this medication. I'm not really sure why, but I trust my doctor, so I'm just going to take my medications. The last question, do you feel differently now than you did before you started your medications? Many patients did say that, yes, they do feel better. And they do feel different now that they've started the new medications. The medication-related problems were then categorized into these seven categories. First is adverse effects, fear or anxiety, no refills on current prescriptions, care transition resulting in confusion to medication regimen, complexity of regimen, forgetfulness, and lack of understanding. As you can see, this is how I categorize the different medication-related problems. So if a patient said, yes, I'm out of my medications, I correlated this to a patient had no refills. If a patient responded yes to having difficulty taking any of their medications, this was categorized into having fear or anxiety. If there were any changes in the medications they were taking, I resulted this as care transition confusion. And going into my interview, if a patient had many medications and were taking medications several parts of the day. I correlated this to regimen complexity. If a patient forgot to take their medications during the week, that was correlated with forgetfulness. Um, number five, if the patient did not understand what their medication was used for, that's lack of understanding. And number six, do you feel differently now than you did before you started your medications? This was a way for me to, to see if the patient was experiencing any adverse effects. So the medication-related problems are um, seen here. So 0% of patients had any adverse effects from their medications. But as you can see, seven patients both had a very complex regimen and also admitted to forgetfulness. Five, five patients, again, had no refills on their current, um, current prescription, and six patients had lack of understanding. Other medication-related problems identified during the visit that was not in um, a category I could put was an inaccurate, fill, an inaccurate pill box. So patients who were supposed to take medications two times a day maybe had them in morning, noon, and nighttime. A patient taking medications one time a day accidentally maybe had two tablets in the morning spot. Um, many patients also did not know how to use their inhaler or glucometer correctly, which is alarming in patients with COPD or diabetes. And many patients were using expired medications because they didn't know medications could expire. So a patient with a 90-day supply who keeps getting it refilled would just keep using old medications without realizing that that bottle had been filled two years ago, and at that point, that medication is probably not good to use anymore. In conclusion, medication-related problems are prevalent amongst patients admitted to the visiting nurse service. The patient data collected through telehealth monitoring may be utilized to assess patient progress, and pharmacists in the home health care setting can impact patient care and outcomes. The next research project I will be discussing is the first research project, so Tom's project, which fo focuses on heart failure. It is the most common principal discharge diagnosis among Medicare beneficiaries. It's the second most expensive condition billed to Medicare. 30-day heart failure-related readmissions as a Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services CMS performance standards. So as we know, if a patient is readmitted to the hospital for heart failure, they will not get reimbursed. Now, there are a lot of benefits for adding a pharmacist onto a care team for a patient with heart failure. So that includes a 25% relative risk reduction for readmission, a 13% relative reduction in all-cause mortality, an improved quality of life, and no increase in cost of care. His project was also a prospective study approved by the University of Rhode Island, IRB. It 
took place from December 2013 to April 2014. The primary objective is to determine if home health pharmacy service improves patient medication adherence as well as reduces hospital admissions. Patients were included if they were discharged to VNS with a primary diagnosis of heart failure. They were referred for inclusion within one week of admission. They had to be willing and able to give informed consent. They were excluded, of course, if they were unable to give informed consent and if they were entirely dependent on caregiver for medication management. The primary outcome looked at adherence and the Mariski eight item medication adherence questionnaire was utilized to see change from baseline. The secondary diagnosis was a 30 day heart failure related readmissions um, included patients versus agency wide patients. This is an example, well this is the Morisky eight item medication adherence questionnaire. Um, as you can see, this is a validated adherence assessment. It is reproducible and feasible to replicate throughout pharmacies, including the community pharmacy setting. Um, it is an adherence assessment tool that is subjective to patient response. So as you can see, these are yes and no questions and patients are trained to give us the right answers because they don't want their caregivers to worry about them. So even if they may forget to take their medications, they know that the right answer is to say that they don't forget to take their medications. So therefore, that is a limitation. Um, and as you can see, the score here is how Tom measured adherence. So if the score was over two, it indicated low adherence to medications, one or two medication uh, medium adherence as well as zero is a high adherence. So his method was measured in an in-home visit and then telephone follow-up. So the in-home visit was anywhere between 60 to 90 minutes long um, and this included medication reconciliation as well. Obtained consent um, at the visit. There was a baseline assessment questionnaire uh, medication reconciliation was provided as well as medication disease state education. Um, so as you can see, the visits are lengthy, but they are very, very thorough. Telephone follow-up occurred one and four weeks post-visit. It was a call between five to 10 minutes. The same question questionnaire was provided for reassessment of adherence. Um, the patient's progress was monitored as well as looking at the readmission rates. 10 patients were enrolled in his study and three were unable to complete follow-up. Um, as you can see, the mean age was 81.4, and again, the mean number of medications, 15.9, so that doesn't really change between um, you know, my study or his study. It seems that a lot of patients are on just a lot of medications now. Um, as you can see, too, there was a percentage of NYHA class, 70% um, were in class three, and 30% were in class four. This is a graph to show the patients in each adherence category. So the bottom is the amount of weeks post in-home visit. As you can see, zero weeks, there was one patient who had high adherence. Um, and as the weeks went on, that high adherence would increase between patients. Um, because there were patients that were unable to follow up, that's why the N decreases over time. But as you can see, over time, there are no patients who have low adherence to their medications. In terms of heart failure related readmissions, one out of 10 enrolled patients was readmitted to the hospital. However, agency wide, July 2013 to February 2014, 38 of 99 patients were rehospitalized. So that's correlated to 38.4%. The conclusion to his study is that pharmac community pharmacists provided in-home medication teaching can improve medication adherence, can lower 30-day heart failure-related readmissions, and also provides an innovative, unique pharmacy service received exceptionally well and beneficial for all involved. Tom and Ginger studies were so exceptional that it was actually published um, and the successful completion of this research project and subsequent publication paved the way to allow for further pharmacy services within the agency. And this includes further residencies, more students, 
and with the generous support of the Van Buren Charitable Foundation, a pharmacist position. Ginger LeMay was the principal investigator of this application um, titled Expanding the College of Pharmacy and VNS Partnership. We have a $78,000 grant awarded and funded again for a second year to study the benefits of a pharmacist delivered medication reconciliation and medication teaching in patients at higher risk for rehospitalization. The project began February 1st, 2016, and today I'll be presenting the prospective data collection with interim results from the first 12 months. This is the press release um, stating that we have a grant that allows visiting nurse services to expand pharmacist services in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. The home visit process is the same um, medication reconciliation provided to every patient. Every patient visit is truly different, so it depends on what the patient's primary concern is. If their primary concern is that their Advair inhaler is too expensive and it can't be covered by insurance, then that focus of that visit is to see if they can be on a cheaper inhaler, and if not inhaler, then a nebulizer solution. Um, if a patient's primary concern is that they don't check their blood sugars every day like they should, uh, maybe they check it once a week because of fear of, of um, having to test, then the goal of that visit will be to provide support and education so that the patient can test their blood sugars every day. So every visit is truly different. Um, but medication teaching is always provided. Every single time I go into a home visit, I do sit down with the bottles in front of me and I say, all right, so this is lisinopril. Can you tell me what this is used for? And if the patient can't tell me what it's used for, then that's when I will explain this is for your blood pressure. And at the end, teach back always occurs so that they can teach it back to me. Adherence support is provided. We do provide our patients with a pill box if that's how they want to provide, if that's how they want to organize their medications. A lot of times I will sit with the patient and make sure that they can fill the pill box correctly, correctly because there's no use in providing a pill box if they can't show you that they can use a pill box. Um, I've also teamed up with other pharmacies that provide medications in med packs so that the patients don't have to worry about having to fill a pill box every week. Um, again, the community pharmacy referrals and liaisons occur, as well as prescriber communication and interface. If I feel like a patient needs a dose reduction or dose increase, I will call the doctor to recommend that. Nowadays, my concern is with the opioids. So a lot of patients who are taking a pain medication and also maybe a sleep medication and a muscle relaxant are at highest risk for respiratory depression. So in these patients, I will recommend Narcan. So the interventions are endless. They're very unique depending on each patient because every patient truly needs something different, but I'm happy to do it all. So with the addition of a pharmacist to the VNS team, we expect a decrease in 30-day hospital readmission rates and ED visits, an increase in patient medication ad adherence, an increase in nursing time by removing the medication burden, an increase in patient quality of life and satisfaction with pharmacy service, an increase in patient referrals from the community and physicians with the goal to reduce hospital readmission rates by 5 to 10% for high-risk patients. The mean age in our patients was 74.7 years of age. Um, again, the mean number of medications is 16.1. Most of our patients are female, and here are the diagnosis of the patients that we see in service. Most patients have hypertension followed by diabetes and psychiatric disorders. And this is just to put into a um, a chart, the Medicare VNA diagnosis. As you can see, a uh, majority of the patients are admitted for cardiopulmonary assessment, followed by disease management education. And this is the primary diagnosis, the major diagnostic criteria um, based on Medicare severity, the diagnosis-related groups. Um, again, the highest patient, the highest amount of patients were seen for circulatory reasons, followed by respiratory, and then skin and soft tissue infections. On average, there were 5.2 medication discrepancies seen in the patients, um, in the patient visits. And this includes wrong dose, wrong medication, 
wrong directions. This also includes if um, the medication reconciliation was incomplete, so maybe the nurse who admitted the patient didn't realize that they had a cabinet full of over-the-counter medications. Um, in our patients, we had 4.5% of patients readmitted to the emergency room uh, or seen in the emergency room, and 13.6 of our patients were unfortunately hospitalized. Um, again, we this was focused on high-risk patients, so high-risk patients have multiple comorbidities, taking multiple medications. So these are patients that are very, very ill. After every patient visit, we always ask for a pharmacist satisfaction survey to be completed because we like to get an idea of what the patients think of having a pharmacist on service. It sounds like a great idea. We have data to support that it's a great idea, but we really want to know what the patients think. As you can see, many patients were satisfied with the service. Um, a lot of patients appreciated the idea of having someone come sit down with them to go over their med medications, especially if they live alone, have no car to go to the pharmacy, so they don't have the opportunity to go pick up their medications and speak to the pharmacist at their Walgreens or Rite Aid or CVS. And how would the pharmacist know that Mr. A is at home with no support and doesn't know what medications he's taking? Um, as you can see, a lot of patients to appreciated um, having a better understanding of the medications that they're taking. It's important to me as a pharmacist that every patient knows why they're taking their medication. So these are some of the comments that were left about the pharmacist visits. There was no bribery intended in any of these um, surveys. These were all truthful and confidential. So lastly, I'd like to talk about pharmacist program sustainability, because as we know, this is a great service, but pharmacists have a high cost to them. Although at the end, it is worth it if we prevent hospital readmissions. So our last resident, our current resident actually, is pursuing her research project um, on sustainability. So currently, no pharmacist practices in the home health care model are established within the state of Rhode Island. And with the progress we have been able to make at the visiting nurse service, practice sustainability is important since we have shown benefit to incorporating pharmacists on the interdisciplinary teams. This research project is centered around medication therapy management and Medicare beneficiaries and the possible channels for payment with the completion of a patient medication review. Along with investigating reimbursement potentials, the study will help us understand what types of medication-related problems affect the home health population. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island Blue Chip from Medicare currently partners with Outcomes MTM Services to bill MTM claims and analyze cost savings through pharmacist interventions. Cost savings from these MTM billings is how this insurance company is justifying incorporating pharmacists into ambulatory care settings, such as the VNS. If the cost saving ratio is above the threshold of one per three, there is potential for pharmacist employment. So this is a great avenue to explore. In this particular study, the inclusion criteria includes 65 years and older, um, so patients who were at this age range. They were admitted to visiting nurse services of Newport and Bristol counties. They had Blue, Chip, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island Blue Chip for Medicare beneficiary, which is a majority of patients in Rhode Island. Um, this plan already offers billable MTM services for this group of beneficiaries, but Blue Cross has not incorporated home health MTM to any of their services thus far. The group represented in this study reflect the high-risk patients we often serve at VNS. So again, the patient population is there at our fingertips. It's just accessing this MTM cost savings program into the home care services that we provide. Once the patients were identified from VNS admission data, they were contacted to schedule a home MTM visit with the pharmacist. The pharmacist completed a patient interview and medication interview with the goal of identifying and acting on medication-centered interventions that would benefit patient therapy. 
Data collected include reason for VNS admittance, number of comorbid diagnosis, the number of prescriptions, and over-the-counter meds, as well as the type of pharmacist intervention along with the outcome of that intervention. Intervention categories were assigned to coordinate with current billable outcomes MTM claim categories, and that's listed here on this slide. The enrollment period is from July 2017 to April 2017. As of April 1st, 2017, we ha she has 16 patients enrolled. The average age is 81.5 years of age. Most of the patients were male. Primary diagnosis have included myocardial infarction, heart failure, COPD, wound care, falls, Alzheimer's disease, UTIs, and also surgical aftercare. This data represents the type of pharmacist-initiated medication therapy interventions discovered during home MTM sessions. These correlate with potential cost savings depending on their severity. As you can see, a majority of the patients, 18.4%, um, needed immunization, so whether that be flu or pneumonia or the shingles vaccination or Tdap, 15.1% um, of patients were identified for inappropriate administration or technique, so for adherence claims. 11.8% had new or changed over-the-counter therapy. 12.5% had new or changed prescription therapy. Each identified medication-related problem from the previous slide is associated with an intervention severity level when the claim is submitted. The severity helps payers determine the cost savings from the therapy intervention provided. With the interventions recorded, the severity levels assigned to each claim are shown on the slide. In total, there was over $2,500 in healthcare savings associated with just 15 patients. There was also an additional patient that was omitted from the cost savings reported due to a unique circumstance. This particular patient had seven medication interventions that prevented a life-threatening situation outcome. Her billing alone would have equated to an additional $93,000, contributing to a total of $119,000 for all study participants seen. So this is a huge avenue that can be explored for pharmacists in the home care setting. As you can see, we have had great success integrating pharmacy and home care. Heart failure patients and patients with home med monitors are just two small examples in a large patient population who are on v VNS service. As a pharmacist, I'm humbled and I'm honored to be able to work with these patients to help them manage their medications and their current disease states. So the next steps, we would, of course, continue the PGY-1 pharmacy resident and pharmacy student program. The Van Buren funded pharmacist is in place through July, uh, I'm sorry, January 31st, 2018. We are going to continue to analyze the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island Medicare claims data for MTM billing for sustainability. And we would like to fund a full-time pharmacist post-grant post -grant funding. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge three important people at the Visiting Nurse Service, Candace Sharkey, our CEO, Sue Dugan, our Director of Quality, as well as Charlene Eggman, our Quality and Compliance Clinical su Supervisor for supporting the pharmacy services since we first started in 2013. Uh, lastly, these are my references. And I would be happy to take any questions at this time. Yes, sure. Yes. How did you decide on what was your high-risk criteria? So we utilized the SHP report, who, who identifies for us high-risk patients as well as moderate-risk patients. Um, they, I believe their formula is based off of how many disease states they have as well as the amount of medications they are on. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, on average, you know, the pharmacists who we were working full-time, mm -hmm. Sure, so um, again, it depends on the type of patients it is. If it's a patient that is newly admitted to service and they need everything listed um, in that slide, then that visit can take anywhere up to an hour, an hour and a half. So in a day, four to five, four patients maybe total. Um, 
for patients who need follow-up or any uh, adherence, education, or support, then those visits are going to be a lot shorter. Um, so in my experience, visits have taken up to 30, 30 minutes and as much as two hours. And that's not including if I have to call the doctor or the pharmacist um, and get follow-up calls back and um, all of that. <laughs> so uh, again, it depends on the type of patient it is. So if it's a new patient who wants to get started on using a pill box, and that's a patient I will see two or three times just to make sure that they are adherent to their medications and they can um, fill the pill box themselves. As long as the patient is still on VNS services, I am allowed to see the patient as many times as I want and provide as much follow-up as I feel is needed for the patient. Of course, of course, yes. The nurses love our notes just because we're so thorough and talking about what we assess. Um, but we do it soap note format so that every single clinician that takes care of that patient will have access to see what we've talked about and when the patient was seen by the pharmacist. Everything is documented through our EMAR system. And does the nurse also, so the nurse has the mm -hmm. and does the medication record for you? Yes. Exactly, exactly. And sometimes the patients won't have skilled nursing services. Sometimes they're only admitted for PT services. Um, it is recommended that every single time someone goes into the house, a medication reconciliation is performed. And it is. It's just a complete medication review that's occurring on top of the medication reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So I try to present myself in a way where I'm there to help them. And of course, like you said, I can't go searching through every part of their house. Um, but generally, when I explain to them that, you know, I'm not here to judge them or I'm not here to take anything away that they don't want me to take just to review the medications that are in the house, they'll say, go ahead, you know, I keep things in the bathroom. If you want to look in the cabinet, that's fine. Um, or I'll ask, is there anywhere else you're keeping your medications just so I can take a look at? Yes, exactly, exactly. Or the cabinet. A lot of patients have told me that they have their own CVS in their home. Usually that means their own closet full of over-the-counter medications. And they'll say, you can have at it if you want to go look through that. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Yes, so that's part of the interventions that per, that is provided. So if a patient is on a medication that is on the beers list and is inappropriate, then I will make a call to the primary care physician. Just for the FYI, mm -hmm. uh, grant to redo the, uh, the medication reconciliation, yes. which will come out in 2018, mm -hmm. which you all have to do. And, uh, <laughs> in there, we, all, we also got something done that I've been fighting for for years, and that's the physician is going to be required to put the indication of why they prescribed the product. Absolutely. On the prescription. Because we, get, we don't know why most people don't know why they never took part of 16 or something. Exactly. But the med rec is going to be pretty complex, but it's going to be standardized. But right now, there's no standardization. Of right. Med rec. Mm -hmm. So that's part. The we've had a fight with the, the CMS because they don't understand the beers list. No. Because we work so hard on that beer mm -hmm. system, but it's always well, the doc's been giving it, they've been taking this for since I was, uh, you know, 50. Yes, and now it's 65. Exactly. Why, why do I have stopped taking it? Right, and the doctors usually just agree with it. Right, and there's a fight for us. Exactly. So, the beers list, also any interactions um, that come up, those are all the interventions that I take a look at for every patient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, absolutely. So um, to answer your first question, the, the nurses I work with are extraordinary. I mean, they're angels to these patients. Um, 
but I think that the way pharmacists are trained to look at medications and to assess how medications work in your body and interactions is, um, it's a little different than how nurses were, cha were trained. And especially if you take a patient who was admitted for wound care, okay, and they have an hour of nursing services, um, and they spend 30 to 45 minutes on that wound change, and then they only have that 15 minutes to provide medication teaching, that's an opportunity for pharmacists to go in with the nurse or after the nurse to provide additional training and help for the patient. Um, and I'm sorry, your second question? Following. Yes, yes, so a lot of times that occurs with over-the-counter medications. So a lot of times patients see something on TV or Dr. Oz has something on TV, so they go out and buy the product. Um, a lot of patients may not need over-the-counter medications, especially since we're not really sure what they're using it for. So that's one particular area that I try to simplify medications. Sometimes, too, what I see is that a patient is on a medication that causes an adverse effect, and then the doctor will add a medication to treat the adverse effect. So if a patient is on a heart medication and one of the adverse effects is that it causes edema, then the patient will have an order for Lasix to treat the edema when really it was the heart medication that was causing the edema. So simplifying the medication regimen in that way too has um, been something that I will call the prescribers for as well. So thankfully, thankfully in Rhode Island, we have integrated pharmacy into a lot of different care settings, including primary care, physician offices. So I haven't experienced a lot of pushback. Um, I think when you present yourself in a way where you're working as part of a team for the patient's benefit, then they tend to perhaps listen a little bit harder um, and to, you know, to say that you have some validity. So I haven't had a lot of pushback. Um, but, you know, in that case. I don't see them doing much medication reconciliation. I see them <laughs> just wanting to fix the right prescription. Right. Put the meds to fix it. Right. Don't look at the whole big picture. Exactly. And, and then if, if that's the case, then that would be an area where I would call just to let them know that perhaps they don't know what's going on in the home. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's an area that's absolutely worth exploring. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, hopefully with this position taking off and having MTM services on board, that will be an area that we'll also incorporate into our pharmacy services. Yes. Um, so we are... A, a relatively small facility. We have about 170 total um, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and that includes any of the assistants as well. And then when you do your services, they're not available, they're a couple months, and then is that why you rely on the grant funding? At this time, yes, exactly, exactly. But hopefully with the medication therapy management component added on, we'll be able to bill for some of these services that we already do. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.